Hi, in this video I'm going to introduce the notion of an EN algebra in an infin uh, symmetric monoidal infinity category where n is the natural number. For n equals 1 we'll see that this recovers the concept of an associative algebra and for n equals infinity this will recover the notion of a symmetric algebra or commutative algebra in a symmetric monoidal infinity category. The, the ends in between will interpolate between those t these two extremal cases. We will discuss how EN algebra in the infinity category of spaces look like and this will be important for further developments of, of higher algebra and also in our course about topological cyclic homology. Hi, I'm Thomas Nikolaus from Mathematics Münster. And in order to talk about EN algebras, I want to, of course, will use what we've done in the previous video, namely talk about symmetric monoidal infinity categories. C is our generic letter for symmetric monoidal infinity category. And in fact, we can, we can take this pretty much as a black box. You can just assume that there is a working theory of symmetric monoidal infinity categories and we will not need to go into it in detail today. So if you haven't watched the last video, you can just take this as a black box. Otherwise, I refer you to the last video of our higher algebra theories. But sort of the examples that we will need are the following. So first is if C is an ordinary, C is an ordinary symmetric monoidal category, monoidal one category, then the nerve of C is a symmetric monoidal infinity category, canonically. And we will also need an enhanced version of that, which strictly speaking I haven't done in my last lecture, but which works exactly the same, namely if C, C is a symmetric monoidal, monoidal topologically enriched or simplicially enriched category then the homotopy coherent nerve in delta C, I guess beforehand we had the delta upstairs, the homotopy coherent nerve is also a symmetric monoidal infinity category canonically and this works exactly the same as the example beforehand. And the third example that will be relevant for us is if you take the infinity category of spaces then this inherits a symmetric monoidal structure. I think I sort of dropped this as a side comment. And this last, in the last lecture, this is given by Cartesian product. And that is a symmetric monoidal category, pretty much like you're used to from ordinary category theory. Whenever you have an infinity category which has finite Cartesian products, you can consider it as a symmetric monoidal infinity category. And in fact, you can also interpret this example as a special case of example two, where you just equip the, and you just define the infinity category of spaces as a homotopy coherent nerve of the category of Kahn complexes. And then this obviously has an actual sort of simplicially enriched symmetric monoidal structure given by Cartesian product. And the fourth example is a slight variation of the last one is when you say pointed spaces and you equip it with the smash product. And recall the smash product of pointed spaces is just you take the Cartesian product and you quotient by the wedge sum. It's the smash product and this of course the homotopy quotient but if we work with uh, Kahn complex this is, you can just model this by the actual quotient. Okay so these are the examples of um, symmetric monoidal infinity categories and as usual we'll I mean somehow Really, I mean, I'm already uh, using the abuse of notation where I just denote the underlying category and leave the rest of the structure implicit. I'll, I'll keep using that today. And in a symmetric monoidal infinity category, you can define what an algebra is. And Achim has done that in a video about Hochschild homology in a, in a general stable infinity category. So you can go watch this video, but let me just repeat the definition for the sake of completeness. An associative algebra in C is uh, in a symmetric monoidal infinity category C is a symmetric monoidal functor, monoidal functor from the nerve of the category S tensor active into C. 
where uh, this category was the category whose objects are finite sets and whose morphisms were morphisms of finite sets with a chosen linear order on pre-images of points. And uh, composition was given by lexicographic ordering and this was a symmetric monoidal category by means of disjoint union as a symmetric monoidal structure and an algebra, an associative algebra was just denoted, uh, was just defined to be such a functor. And the category of associative algebras Ixc is just defined as a, maybe I should define it as a category of symmetric monoidal functors from Ns tensor active into C. Okay, that is uh, what an associative algebra is. And then we also have the notion of a commutative algebra in a symmetric monoidal infinity category C is given by a symmetric monoidal functor, monoidal functor, functor from the nerve of the category com tensor active into C. And com tensor active is, was something very easy. It was just the category of finite sets and morphisms of finite sets. And uh, I guess implicitly I'm using here somehow that these categories carry like the universal associative and the universal commutative algebra objects given by the one point set in each case. And then the infinity category of commutative algebras in C is defined to be the category of symmetric monoidal functors from the nerve of this common tensor active, active into C. Okay, that uh, defines this. And let me immediately issue a warning here. And this is an important warning, namely that in an ordinary category, in a one category, or a symmetric monoidal one category, I should say C, we have that uh, the category of commutative algebras in C is actually a full subcategory of the category of algebras in C, associative algebras of C. Right, in other words, it's just a property of an associative algebra to be commutative. And then the morphisms are the same. And this is completely false. This is false in infinity categories. And what is false? What is false is in fact that um, it is true that there's a functor from commutative algebras to algebras. This is induced by the symmetric monoidal functor, which uh, goes, I guess, from S tensor active to COM tensor active, which just forgets the pre-orders on pre-images. But this functor, so in general, we still have a functor from IXC to C, uh, commutative IXC to IXC, and this functor is far from being fully faithful. More precisely, it's not just, I mean, being in the image here is a property, but lifting an associative algebra to a commutative algebra is not just a property, but it's extra structure. So you have to write down a witness of the fact that the, the multiplication is commutative, that's extra structure. And that's something that's completely different to ordinary land. And um, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna introduce a whole lot of infinity categories interpolating between the two, between commutative algebras in C and associative algebras in C. And that's gonna be the EN algebras we're gonna talk about. And that's the following definition. So first of all, um, let n be a natural number in between zero and infinity. So zero is allowed, infinity not for the moment. And now we define a symmetric monoidal infinity category. 
en tensor active, as the homotopy coherent nerve, of the following topologically enriched category. Topologically enriched category. Given as follows, so the objects, so this is a topologically enriched category of geometric nature, so the objects are going to be disjoint unions of disks finite disjoint unions of disks and by a disk for today I will just mean it's going to be a squarish disk so I, I will mean the n-fold Cartesian product of the interval 0, 1. It's like an open disk and so really I mean the n is fixed right so what we're going to have is for every so this is like k-fold and k ranges so I'm allowing the empty disjoint union until all finite disjoint unions. So in other words, the objects are just given by integers k, by uh, natural numbers k, but I'm going to think of it as disks. And what are the morphisms? So I have to tell you what morphisms from disjoint union disks into another disjoint union of disks are. And this is k and this is maybe k prime many and this are given by rectilinear embeddings. Rectilinear embeddings. I.e. well embeddings of topological spaces of topological spaces Right, so this is a topological space, this is a topological space, it just makes sense to talk about an embedding. So embed embedding is in particular uh, an injective map and I guess by invariance of domain it's exactly injective maps. It exhibits this guy as a subspace of this guy and which on each disk is rectilinear, i.e given by an affine, affine linear map with matrix of the form alpha 1 through alpha n and zeros here with alpha i positive integers. Right, so in each, each coordinate it's basically a dilation and I also say it's affine linear so I allow myself to move the zero vector around. Right, so what's a morphism? So I guess somehow a picture of a morphism from k disks to one disk would be like you, you have a big disk which is the target. So here as a target I have dn and then I'm going to sort of put some small disks in there. Right, somehow this is kind of given by a rectilinear map from four disks into here and I really have to number them because I remember the order. That's how a typical map from four disjoint unions of I guess in this case d2 into d2 looks like in this category. And uh, composition in this category is just composition of maps. Maybe I, I read that, that will be a very illuminating line. Composition is composition. <laughs> Okay, and um, this category is actually in fact topologically enriched. So I guess yeah, I just told you what the objects are and in fact, you know, if you think about what, what this is as a set, this is going to be an open subset of some Rn, right? Because you're just remembering those guys and I guess another, another copy of a disk uh, which tells you where the center point goes to. And then, you, I mean, this just exhibits this as an open subset of Rn and you give it the subspace topology. This makes this actually a topologically enriched category and this is also, this category is topologically enriched canonically and symmetric monoidal. Metric monoidal 
by disjoint union. Right, you can just take the disjoint union of disks and that defines a symmetric noidal structure and of course this is not going to be the co-product in that category but it's, it's a disjoint union of disks. Okay, and then our category EN tensor active is by definition the homotopy coherent nerve and by what I said earlier this is going to be a symmetric monoidal infinity category. And note, um, I guess I'm, I'm using this somewhat funny EN tensor active terminology to, to be consistent with what we did earlier and what Jacob Lurie does in his books but I guess maybe I mean for one one could for example call it the little cubes thing or I guess Ayala Francis call this category disk N. So I, I just use EN tensor active to go with the terminology which is consistent with the rest of the course but which I, admittedly is not the most suggestive notation here. Okay, and once I have that, I can define what an EN algebra is, the following definition. An EN algebra in C, C is gonna be symmetric monoidal as before. C is a symmetric monoidal functor, noidal functor, EN tensor active into C. And the category of the infinity category of EN algebras is just defined. Well, maybe not in the sink. The, the infinity category of EN algebras in C is going to be defined to be the category, the infinity category of symmetric monoidal functors from this EN tensor active into C. Okay. Right. And now let's try to understand that definition a little bit better. And in order to understand that, let's first contemplate what the mapping space is and how this category even looks like. And so note, first of all, the first thing is if you have a map from here to there, you can, I mean, the fact that these are continuous maps tells us they send disks to disks, right? So basically, uh, we just have to figure out which disks are sent to which disks. So you see the whole mapping spaces In, in this EN tensor active are determined by, by the mapping spaces in EN tensor active from K ingoing disks to one outgoing disk. Right, because all the other mapping spaces, you just have to remember like somehow you, for each disk here, you pick the pre-image of disks which map to that and then the rest is just re recording that. Okay, so in that sense, it's enough to somehow understand the homotopy type of those mapping spaces. And let's do that. So, if we have a map of disks, n cop k copies of the n disk to itself, such an embedding, um, what you can do is you can actually write down a map which is evaluation at center points. Right? Each disk has a point in the middle and I guess maybe the way I wrote down the disk was uh, copies of the interval 0, 1 to the n, then the middle point would be I guess one half in each coordinate. And so that gives you a map into a space which is called the configuration space of k points in the n. So, and this is K copies. What is that space? That space is by definition just a full sub, uh, subspace of the space of, I mean, dn to the K. Namely, what you do is you just uh, record K different points in the n, but it's called the configuration space because we're not allowing all configurations of points, but we're only allowing those where no two points agree. 
right? This is because I said an embedding. It wouldn't be injective if, if two points agree here. So that's by definition just a full subspace here. It gives it a subspace topology. It's called the configuration space. This is a much studied space in topology, in fact. And um, the claim is that this map, the evaluation at center point, is actually a homotopy equivalence. And that is uh, the first exercise I want to give you today to work out that this map is actually a homotopy equivalence. And let me maybe give you a rough idea. I mean, the, the idea is just to write down an inverse, basically. And one, I mean, you, you really think of, of this as follows. If you have a sort of configuration of disks, the point is that the size of these disks doesn't really matter because the radius is just a positive integer. The positive integers are contractible. So what you could basically do is, here, from here, you would go to the center points. And then there's an inverse map where around each center point you choose a disk which is small enough so that no two disks intersect. You could, for example, always take some like a third of the minimal distance between each points. Something like that, and then you can write down a canonical homotopy between any two maps. That I want to leave as a first exercise for today. And by the way, I guess I should have, I mean, this looks a lot like disks, but by definition I had little squares, so it would be better if my diagram looked a little bit more squarish here, but I, somehow the more canonical way is uh, we're used to in topology is to draw disks. But I guess, I, I, I hope everyone is happy to translate between disks and squares up to homeomorphism. Okay, so um, good. So now we know that the homotopy types of these mapping spaces in this infinity category E and tensor active are basically given by configuration spaces. So what does this mean? For, for example, what is the mapping space in EN tensor active from a disk to a disk? A single copy. So that is now actually the configuration space of a single point in EN. Right? But what is that? Well, that is obviously a contractible space because you can always just up to homotopy move the one point into the center of DN. Right, just, I mean, this is a linear homotopy, just uh, showing that this space is in fact contractible. So this space is contractible. In other words, if you have a functor from this category to a symmetric monoidal category, you don't have any action on the underlying object. So if I have an EN algebra, then of course the evaluation on the one disk is going to be the, the object, which I think about being the underlying object of my EN algebra, and this tells me there's no like endomorphism, no structural morphism on my EN algebra. But what about, for example, maps in EN tensor active, DN disjoint DN into DN? Well, this is now the configuration space of two points in the N disk. And what is the homotopy type of that? Well, what you can do is you can always, by a linear homotopy, move one of the points into the center of the disk. And then the other point will just float around the center point. And you can always sort of norm it to have, say, distance one half from the center point. I guess maybe distance one third or something so that it stays inside of my, my open disk. And then uh, you see this is actually the same as choosing this point on a sphere. So it's going to be a sphere in the n, which is going to be an n minus 1 sphere. Well, the homotopy type of this space is Sn minus 1. So in other words, if I have a functor from En tensor active into my symmetric monoidal category, and I want to think of this functor, maybe let me write it A underbar as an algebra, then somehow the underlying, underlying algebra is uh, the evaluation A bar underlying disk N, a single copy of disk N, which is I'm just going to denote A. And this computation tells me that I in particular actually get a map from A tensor A into A, the mapping space, so I get a map 
from the Sn minus 1 into this space. Right, in particular, I get a chosen point in the space corresponding to the zero cell of Sn minus 1. That is somehow the multiplication. And then there's, this is going to extend to a point. So with this analysis, you can start to get a feeling for what En algebras look like. But before we go, I mean, I will go, I will explain a little bit better what En algebras look like to give you a better intuition. But this is just what it is by definition, the kind of structure you get. But of course, I mean, giving in symmetric, functor of symmetric monoidal infinity categories is a very complicated thing. Actually, you get a lot of structure. So in particular, this structure, but way more. And in order to understand what En algebras are, let's start with the case n equals 1. So that's the following proposition. So there's an equivalent. Um, N S tensor active into E1 tensor active of symmetric monoidal infinity categories sending, well, I guess on object it sends a finite set S to the disjoint union over S of N dis uh, one disks. Okay, and why is that? And in fact, actually, I wrote the result in this direction, but the can more canonical functor, in fact, goes from the right to the left, and then you argue that it's invertible. And how does this work? Um, the first step is to observe that E1 tensor active is essentially a one category. What does this mean? This means all the mapping spaces, so it's equivalent to the nerve of a one category. And as we've seen earlier, this is equivalent to showing that all the mapping spaces are discrete. So homotopy equivalent to their pi naught. And this follows immediately if you just think about what configuration spaces of points in a one disk are. Right, if I, if I just give you a configuration of points in a disk, what is that? I guess I can just pick an order. So the homotopy type of the mapping space in E1 tensor active from n copies of D1 into D1, this is just this picture. You just put an ordering of your points and that is what it is. And so not only does this tell you that the space is essentially discrete, but it is also end equivalent to S tensor active. Why is that? Because, you know, giving such a map exactly amounts to giving an ordering of the points up to homotopy equivalence. And giving a map landing in several copies exactly amounts to giving an ordering of the pre-images of points. And this is exactly what the morphisms in S tensor active are defined. So you see, basically, I get a functor from here to its homotopy category, where you quotient by equivalences, and that is exactly exhibiting the homotopy categories S tensor active, and then showing this is equivalent to S tensor active. This is just uh, giving you an idea, and of course you have to check that this is compatible with composition and so on. I mean, the easiest way is maybe to write down a functor and show it's fully faithful and essentially subjective. But then, of course, I mean, this functor this functor uh, is symmetric monoidal. Right, it sends disjoint unions of, of objects to disjoint unions. A functor we've just implicitly constructed without writing it down in the last step. And then there's the last step, namely, I guess we, we, we claimed this was an equivalence of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. And I haven't really talked about the, the category or the infinity category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. I guess, I guess I've only talked about uh, 
specific symmetric monoidal infinity categories so far, but there is an infinity category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. And you can ask yourself, when is the functor between symmetric monoidal infinity categories and equivalence? And the statement is pretty much like an ordinary category theory, a, functor between, a symmetric monoidal functor between symmetric monoidal infinity categories is an equivalence in this infinity category. In other words, it admits an inverse functor which also symmetric monoidal and natural transformations which are trans, uh, symmetric monoidal to the identity both ways if and only if the underlying functor is an equivalence of infinity categories. And why is that? Well, by definition, the symmetric monoidal infinity category was just basically given by a functor from n fin star to cut infinity. And for functor categories, we've already used a couple of times that uh, equivalences are detected pointwise. And symmetric monoidal functors, basically, basically the whole functor on objects was determined by the underlying category. So you can pretty easily see that if you have a functor between symmetric monoidal categories, if you go into the model, you see that this is an equivalence precisely if the underlying functor is an equivalence. So thus, it is an equivalence of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. Okay, and that finishes my proof sketch. And what is, what's the consequence of that, the corollary? of this is that we have an equivalence between E1 algebras in C and algebras in C. Right, because they are now defined as functors out of a given indexing category. Okay, so that tells you what uh, E1 algebras in an infinity category C are. And there's an exercise at this point, I guess, Strictly speaking, 1 wasn't the smallest n for which I've defined en. It's also e, e0. So the first part of the exercise is work out what e0 algebras in the symmetric monoidal infinity category are. And the second part, which is really hard and which might be very tricky, is to work out what e2 algebras in the infinity category of ordinary categories are. So. The second exercise, second part of that exercise is really hard and um, but um, the, the real upshot of that second part is work out what the configuration spaces in the E2, uh, E2 tensor active look like. So this, I mean, I can already tell you these have to do with braid groups, so-called braid groups. They are classifying spaces for certain braid groups. And if you know a little bit about that, you, you'll see that these are exactly what is called braided monoidal categories, the E2 algebras in the category of ordinary categories. And that actually, in my opinion, I mean, that's how I, I eventually understood what E2 algebras are by considering braided monoidal categories. That's, in my opinion, the best way to get a feel for what's going on here. So that is somehow for, for people which are a little bit advanced or people who want to get a feel for that, it's, it's a good, good use of time to think about that example for a bit. Okay, so that settles the case n equals 1, maybe n equals 2 if you have done the last exercise. And in general, one can wonder how the different uh, categories of EN algebras are related to each other. And the point is that there are functors from the category E0 into the category E1, oh, sorry, E0 tensor active, E1 tensor active. E2 tensor active and so on. And how are these functors given? These functors are just given by taking the Cartesian product with a one disk. So in other words with an interval. So whenever I have a disjoint union of n disks, I take a Cartesian product with a one disk, I get a disjoint union of n plus one disks. And on maps, it just takes a rectilinear map and associates the identity on the last coordinate, which is again rectilinear. Right, and these are obviously symmetric monoidal functors. So in fact, all these functors just come from topologically enriched symmetric monoidal functors. And by means of that, these are symmetric monoidal such, such, 
we get we get induced functors functors from alk e0 c here we have alk e1 c and we have alk e2 c and so on and one should think of this as sort of forgetful functor. So you have an E0 algebra. Every, this tells me that every E1 algebra has a sort of underlying E0 algebra. It's just pullback along this functor. Every E2 algebra has an underlying E1 algebra, again, given by pullback along this functor. And I guess um, this is also a good exercise at this point to work out what this tower looks like in an ordinary category. And for people who are who did the last exercise about braided monoidal categories, you can think of the way this diagram look, looks like if I set C to be the category of categories, so the 2,1 category of categories. Then this starts looking very interesting. And so I want to define. the infinity category of E infinity algebras is defined as the inverse limit of this, this diagram. In, and the limit is taken in the infinity category of infinity categories. So in other words, an E infinity algebra just consists of a sequence of E n algebra together with an equivalence of the underlying guy beforehand. That's how limits were computed in infinity categories. And that is somehow, so, so we've understood somehow what the start of that tower looks like, namely E, under, and E 1 algebra are just associative algebras. And so the inverse limit sits at the other range of that tower. And the theorem is the following. Theorem is that we have an equivalence, equivalence um, E infinity algebras in C are equivalent to commutative algebras in C as defined previously by means of symmetric monoidal functors out of COM tensor active. And let me just sketch how this is proven. Proof. And so, so what, you, what you have is that this is, and again, this is going to be a, a sketch. We're entering territory where we're using a lot of black boxes and statements and somehow I guess I, I said this before and I hope not to bore you by repeatedly saying that but somehow the idea is to give you a working feeling for how to work with these symmetric monoidal infinity categories and of course if you really want to dig into the details of that you ha first have to study infinity category theory a little bit more precisely. But um, how does this proof work? So this is by definition the inverse limit of this diagram where, you had, where we had uh, I E N C. And this itself was somehow a functor category from this E N tensor active into C. And basically by the, and I should say symmetric monoidal functor, and by the universal property of co-limits, this is just by, for formal reasons the same as the functor category out of the co-limit of these symmetric monoidal categories, En tensor active into C. Where this co-limit is taken in the category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories, and this is of course only true provided that this co-limit exists. And um, as, as previously in an earlier lecture, there's a little bit of a thing a priori, the universal property guarantees this equivalence on, on underlying spaces to these infinity categories, but by, by some adjunction tricks you also get it on these kind of functor categories. 
And so the statement now really comes down to the claim that this is the same as functors from common tensor active. So the statement really comes true to the claim that the co-limit in the category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories of this EN tensor active is equivalent to the nerve of common tensor active. And that statement I want to leave as an exercise. And so you should black box use two things for this exercise. First of all, a priori it's, it's not so clear how to compute co-limits in the category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. So the claim is, and that you should use, that co-limits in symmetric monoidal infinity categories over like sequential diagrams are computed underlying. So it's a co-limit of infinity categories and as such it's just given by on objects the co-limit of objects and on mapping spaces the co-limit of mapping spaces. So what you really should figure out is what happens under these functors on mapping spaces. And if you think about a little bit about how this category looks like, how the ma mapping spaces in here look like, you basically have to figure out that these mapping spaces are contractible. And so, yeah, I want to leave that as an exercise to think about configuration spaces. Okay, good. And maybe, I mean, this would finish, this finishes the proof. And maybe actually defining, you could define the infinity tensor active as this co-limit. And if you did that, then maybe it would be a little bit more canonical to define E infinity algebras as symmetric monoidal functors out of this E infinity tensor active and not as an inverse limit. But since I didn't want to use co-limits in the definition, something we haven't really studied, I, I give this definition for now. Okay, so that settles the other end of the spectrum, namely that here we have commutative algebras. And so you see this kind of tower of categories, this tower of notions of EN algebras interpolates between associative algebras and commutative algebras. And, and the matter of fact is that as opposed to ordinary land where I have associative algebras and then it's a property whether or not they're commutative and then I'm done, so this tower is eventually constant. In infinity land I have an in, in infinite like sort of tower of possibilities to get more and more commutative. And this actually happens in practice. And I will explain that in a second in the example of the infinity category of spaces. But before I do that, I want to um, state a few formal properties of the category of EN algebra that we will repeatedly use in our course on Hochschild homology. And which are very technical, I mean, the, the proof is technical, but the statement is not so hard given the terminology we've introduced now. And for this, I want to recall that um, let C tensor be a closed symmetric monoidal category. Monoidal category. So recall closed just meant that the tensoring with a single object had an adjoint and or, or weaker assume that the tensor product with a given object C, which is a functor from C to C, commutes with filtered colimits, colimits, and geometric realizations. Realizations. And geometric realization meant uh, delta op indexed colimits. So if, if our category is closed, then of course tensoring with a single object has an edge and so it commutes with all co-limits, but for what we are going to say now, we really only need these weaker conditions. And then under these assumptions, we have the following result. And I, I realized I forgot one condition. Of course, I want and C has all co-limits and limits. <laughs> I guess I, I really want to ask co-limits, otherwise it would possibly be an empty condition to commute with co-limits if my category didn't have co-limits. And uh, for what I'm going to say, this is slightly too strict, but I, I think 
whoever cares about categories which don't have all colimits or limits can figure out what is really needed. Okay, so here's the theorem. And this is, let me attribute, uh, I mean, this is due to many people in different languages, but in the language we are going to phrase it now, it's due to Jacob Lurie, but of course, really, it was already figured out by Boardman Vogt and others and May and so in some model category language. So the statement is the first part is the following. So the infinity category, category ALK E infinity C, uh, E N C, and now N is going to be allowed to be in between zero and infinity. Also, zero and infinity are allowed. Um, admits all limits and colimits. All limits and colimits. Um, the functor. Alk ENC down to C, which is a forgetful functor. So what is a forgetful functor? This is just evaluation at DN. Right? If I have a symmetric monoidal functor, I can just evaluate at the object DN that defines a functor from the point to the category EN tensor active. Somehow the functor which assigns to an EN algebra the underlying object of C. This preserves preserves filtered colimits um, geometric realizations and all limits. And maybe I should say um, the class of all colimits generated by filtered colimits and geometric realizations is, is the class of so-called sifted colimits. So mo very often you will see this stated as it preserves sifted colimits and all limits, but this is actually equivalent to the statement I make here. And um, moreover, it detects equivalences. Right, so map in the infinity category of EN algebras is an equivalent precisely if the underlying map is an equivalent. And this is again not really hard by the fact that, I mean, being symmetric monoidal, this functor has to send the something like the k disjoint unions of the n disk to tensor products of A. And, and from this, you basically, it's, it's not so hard to sh show that it detects equivalences. Right. Um, that's the first statement. The second statement about this category is, um, I guess, this basically tells you, this statement basically tells you how sifted colimits, I guess, uh, filtered colimits, geometric realizations, and limits in this infinity category looks like. But I made the statement that it admits all colimits. And the point is that coproducts are in general complicated. And this you can already see if you think about ordinary land, right? If you just have the category of algebras, not necessarily commutative algebras, then the coproduct of commutative algebra uh, of not necessarily commutative algebras is some sort of free algebra on on the two generators. It's like the amalgamated product of algebras. So objects in that are going to be in any arbitrary words in any of the two algebras pasted together. So that's that's a kind of complicated construction. The same is true here. But in the commutative case, we know what the tensor product of commutative algebras look like, the coproduct. This is just a tensor product. And the same is true here. So for n equals infinity, the coproduct is given by a tensor b. Right? If I have two commutative algebras, a comma b in C alt, then the tensor product is just going to be, as a coproduct, it's just going to be the tensor product, A tensor B. Okay, and um, in general, of course, I mean, 
I mean here of course in fact I'm, I'm claiming implicitly that A tensor B has a canonical structure of commutative algebra in this infinity language which is a non-trivial claim and as such it is a coproduct. Or said differently there is the coproduct exists and the underlying object is just given by the tensor product of the underlying objects. And if, if n is not infinity then still you can make sense of this construction A tensor B but it's not the coproduct anymore. So one way to articulate that is to say that the infinity category alk enc admits a symmetric monoidal structure monoidal structure structure whose such that I mean it's it's the underlying tensor product so the functor c down to c the forgetful functor is symmetric monoidal. And this is terrible use of notation uh, of language, I should say, such that the underlying functor admits a canonical refinement to a symmetric monoidal functor. By this, I just mean if I, if I give you a pair of en algebras, you can write down an en algebra structure on the tensor product, and this assembles into a symmetric monoidal structure of the category on the category of en algebras in C. Okay. So these are the formal properties I want to use about the category of En algebras in C. And I guess at this point some of you might find this very clean and clear and obvious. And some, some of you might be might find this a little bit too much to comprehend what that means. So at this point, a very good exercise is to just specialize this to the case where C is an ordinary one category. Or maybe even C is a category for building groups and see what the corresponding statement mean about ordinary algebras and rings and why those statements are true. And then basically the, the somehow implicit claim is that all of that is true. All of the statements and proofs carry over to this infinity setting except there's a lot of technicalities coming up. And that, uh, that has been overcome by Jacob Lurie in, I guess, section three of higher algebra. Okay. All right, okay, so these are the formal properties about the, of the category of EN algebras, but so unfortunately until now we haven't really seen a single example of an EN algebra, except maybe ordinary associative and commutative algebras. And I will finish this lecture by discussing at length the example of the infinity category of spaces. So example. And this is also in fact a classical example at which uh, people brought me forked have introduced this terminology and discovered the phenomena we are talking about today. So we're going to consider the infinity category of spaces equipped with a symmetric monoidal structure given by by um, Cartesian product. And now I consider commutative algebras in S. And what is this? This is a category of monoids in S, right? So an object in this category of algebras is just an associative algebra in spaces. In other words, it's going to be a space X and you're going to have a map X cross X to X and then an associator and so on and so forth. So that's what I mean I guess by what we said earlier it's the same as an E1 algebra and in classical terminology this would also be called an A infinity algebra following a notation introduced by Stashev. And uh, for such an algebra we have that pi naught of x is an, an actual an actual monoid in set, right? By just taking the multiplication and applying pi naught to it, we get a monoid structure. And we call X group-like, group-like, if this is a group. Pi naught of X is a group. So that's what we call a group-like uh, monoid in spaces and um, 
one can work out that this is equivalent saying pi naught is a group is equivalent to saying the shear map x cross x to x cross x given by sending a comma b to well i guess a times b comma b is, an, is a homotopy equivalence of spaces i mean this is not a not not a hard exercise but yeah you want to maybe talk a little bit about fibration se fi fiber sequences so i don't give this as an official exercise here and uh, an en algebra x in s is called group like if the underlying underlying e1 algebra is Right, so by, by our restriction functors, we had functors from E n algebras to n, E n minus one algebras and so on, and we call it group-like if the underlying E one algebra is group-like. Okay, and so here's the most important construction. So um, for every pointed space, pointed space, space x, i.e. an object in the infinity category of pointed spaces. Re remember space maybe, maybe means Kant complex, but uh, for giving geometric intuition here, it's actually better to think of it as a space. So for now, I want, want, you, to think of this, want you to think of this as an actual space. And so we have, what we can do is we can form the n-fold loop space of X. And what is that? The n-fold loop space of X, you can just think of, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's defined by an iteration of taking loops or what's defined by universal property, but it's just a mapping space from, in pointed spaces from the n-sphere into X. And maybe a somewhat more better way for us is to think of that as a space, as a mapping space of pairs from the n-disc relative boundary into X relative point. Right, by that I mean just the space of maps taking dn to x and the boundary of dn to the point. And the claim is that this is canonically an en algebra in spaces with respect to the Cartesian product. And why is that? And so what is the picture here? The picture is that um, what you do is if you have a bunch of maps from Sn into X, then I have to tell you, I mean, I guess, so when I say this is canonically an En algebra, I mean, this is the underlying object of an En algebra of such a functor. And so what you, what you have to do in order to give this the structure of an EN algebra, you have to tell me how the mapping spaces in my category EN tensor active, in other words, rectilinear maps act on that. And what do I do if I have such a map from say four copies of the disk into X, and I have a rectilinear map from here into a disk, right? In other words, some way of embedding those. Well, what I'm gonna do is those maps will send the boundary to the base point. I can just extend it to a map from this whole disk and get an induced map from X. And that is a picture. And um, if you haven't seen that, my next exercise at this point is to make this precise. So write down actual, an actual EN algebra object in the infinity category of spaces. And in fact, what, what you can do here is you can write it down as, a, as an object, in fact, a functor, a topologically enriched functor in the topologically enriched category of spaces with respect to Cartesian product. And that gives a whole lot of EN algebras in the category of spaces. I'm just taking loop space of any pointed space, n for loop space gives you an EN algebra. And you see also, I guess, morally, the composition comes from the composition of loops. If you have a single loop space that's loops in X, you can compose loops. So this makes precise that composition of loops is an associative algebra. And uh, I guess if you have 
a two-fold loop space, then you can compose loops in two different directions. And that's actually a good way of thinking about an E2 algebra. We'll, we'll make that precise in a second, that an E2 algebra has to do with two different compositions. But that's the way I want to think about it. And the first observation about this is actually because I can invert loops. This is not only an EN algebra in spaces, but it's a group like EN algebra in spaces. So I can invert loops. So, and here's the theorem that Bartman Fogg proved back in the day when they introduced this notion of EN algebra. So they called it this kind of thing little intervals. So they work with little intervals as opposed to little disks. But um, that's the theorem that um, the functor omega n from pointed n connected spaces. So n connected spaces just means that the first n homotopy groups vanish. For example, if n is equals 1, this just means connected. And so there's this functor omega n from n connected spaces in en algebras. That's just, uh, I mean, I guess this is just what I wrote down on object there. You can turn this into a functor. And so the reason I'm saying n connected here means that, I mean, it's because, I mean, omega n only depends on the homotopy groups above degree n. So I can always take the n connective cover and won't change anything. So you could write this down, this functor on pointed spaces as I did, but it didn't, wouldn't depend on the, on the lower Posnikov sections. And so this functor is fully faithful fully faithful with essential image, image the group-like, group-like EN algebras. For any, any N, I guess, in between zero and infinity. And I don't want to allow infinity because, I mean, there is a statement with spectra, which I don't want to make today, but I mean, infinity connected would be trivial and certainly false. Okay, so that's this, the so-called recognition theorem of Boardman and Fork, uh, then in, in some operatic language also reformulated and proven by May. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll sketch a proof for you. But this is some, in some sense one of the most important properties about the infinity category of spaces, that we, we have this equivalence between group-like EN algebras and N-connective objects. And one immediately corollary is the following. That for every, any, any EN algebra A, A in S, um, and any, any connected pointed space X we have we have that maps of EN algebras from the following EN algebra, I can take the n-fold loops of the n-fold suspension of x. <laughs> so the n-fold suspension of a pointed space, again a pointed space, and then I take the n-fold loops and I give this the n-structure coming from omega n. That's an n-fold loop space and I map this into A. And the statement is that this is equivalent to just pointed maps from x into A. Or in other words, saying this a little bit more fancy is omega n sigma n x is a free en algebra on the pointed space x. Right, and this is just maps of pointed spaces. And this is a property we'll use in uh, our course on uh, Hochschild homology. And why is this immediate from bortmann fock theorem? Um, first of all, um, we can consider the full uh, the subspace 
a prime in A consisting of the unit components pi naught A prime in pi naught A. So what I mean is pi naught, pi naught A is a monoid and you can just pass to the connected components which admit inverses in that unit. And then map of En algebras from omega n sigma n x into A will be equivalent to map of En algebras from omega n sigma n x A prime. And why is that? I mean, this is because this is group like. This would, in fact, hold for any group like EN algebra that, I mean, maps out of it into anything can only hit the. It's, it's, it's like saying this construction taking A to A prime is right adjoint to the inclusion of group like EN algebras and EN algebras. And that's just because on pi naught it can only hit those components. Similarly, similarly um, maps of pointed spaces from X into A are equivalent to maps of pointed spaces from X into A prime. And that's because X was assumed to be connected. So it will only hit, the, in fact, the, the trivial component here. So in fact, I could have actually, in fact, passed to the, just to the point here, to the subspace uh, consisting of the connected component. But I mean, let me pass to A prime. Thus, um, we can assume, can assume A prime the A is group-like, without loss of generality, i.e. A is of the form omega n of y for some pointed n-connective space y by the theorem of boltzmann vogt But now let's compute what we get. So we get that En omega n sigma n x into A, which is omega n y, is now again by a Bodman Fork theorem. This is equivalent to map in pointed spaces from sigma nx into y, right? By the fact that this functor is fully faithful, omega n. And now this is actually equivalent to, I guess, map from sigma n is the same as maps in pointed spaces from x into omega n y. But this is just, by definition, this is just a. Okay, and that proves the theorem, or the corollary of the theorem. Let's catch the proof of the recognition theorem of Boltzmann and Fort. So the first step is um, n equals 1. And what's the statement in the case of n equals 1? The statement is that pointed connected spaces, connected in the usual sense, are equivalent to group-like E1 algebras. So this is just the full subcategory of group-like E1 algebras in spaces. And the idea here, or one idea how to prove this, is to actually uh, just explicitly uh, construct an inverse an inverse. And what is the inverse? The inverse is a bar construction. Bar. And what is the bar construction? The bar construction, in fact, the bar construction is of course also defined for a non-group-like algebra, but we are restricted to group-like algebras. And Achim has told us what the bar construction formally is in his video in terms of this cut functor. But let me just um, give you the informal picture. So the bar construction is the co-limit for G and E1 algebra, or actually in this case we restrict it to group-like. As I said, the co-limit over delta op of the simplicial diagram, which is point here, then you have G, and then you have G cross G. And here the three map are given by the two projections and the multiplication. And then here we have three copies of G, four copies of G, and so on. And that's the bar construction. And obviously, this has a canonical base point coming from the inclusion of the point into it. 
and it's connected. And in fact, actually, in order to see that it's connected, you can check, in fact, even more, namely that what you check is somehow that naturally omega of bar g is equivalent to g. And this can be seen by, I guess, this is something which is the standard tool in topology. What you do is you construct a space eg sitting over bg, and the fiber is g, and the space is contractible. This is fiber sequence, and from this it follows that omega bar g is g. And if you, this equivalence you can construct a little bit more carefully, then you see the equivalence of E1 algebras. What does this mean? This means the bar construction just shifts the homotopy groups of g up by one, right? It, it takes all the homotopy groups and shifts it up by one. It constructs a space bar g, or sometimes called bg, whose homotopy groups are the same as the homotopy groups of g, except shifted up by one. And omega shifts homotopy groups down. So you also see if you start with a connected space, take omega, it shifts the homotopy groups down, right? The old pi 1 will be pi 0 of the new space and so on. And then taking bar shifts it up again. And then once you believe that there's a natural map both ways, it's, it's not hard to see that this is an isomorphism on homotopy groups, hence an equivalence. So this shows, this explicit construction shows that this is an equivalence. And that settles the uh, case n equals 1. And then the second step in the proof, or the general step, is actually to prove this by induction on n. So what, you, what you're going to do is like, the first step tells me that I have an equivalence between connected spaces, I mean, and group-like E1 algebra in spaces. And what you can do is, of course, I mean, if I restrict to the full subcategory of two connected spaces here, then I will, over here, by the fact that omega and bar just shifts this equivalence, here I will get those which are, whose underlying space is connected, right? Just because the homotopy groups get shifted. And then also, it's not so hard to see that, in fact, you can, um, you can in fact, uh, look at pointed spaces here. This doesn't make a difference if you just look at pointed spaces with the Cartesian product. And once you do that maneuver, you will see that, in fact, actually, now I can iterate. The point is, this inner category is equivalent to, by again applying the n equals 1 case, this is equivalent to itself algebras, and in fact, group-like algebras, in group-like algebras in spaces. Right, and this is because, I guess, bar and omega will in particular preserve Cartesian products. Or actually I should say maybe on this category it's more like, um, yes, Cartesian products. And this is because this is an equivalent, so it preserves Cartesian products, so it's a symmetric monoidal equivalence between the categories in the middle, and then I can just apply alch to that equivalence. So I see from this equivalence, actually I immediately get that two connective spaces is equivalent to algebras in algebras in S. Right, and I mean, in fact, for every n, by iterating, I get that n connective spaces is equivalent to n connective spaces. And then the proof of the main theorem, or the recognition principle, follows from the fact that iterating en algebras produces, I mean, e e1 algebras in e1 algebras is, in fact, the same as e2 algebras. And that is the more following more general theorem, which I think is basically the most important result about e and algebras, and this is done additivity. And this theorem is actually, I guess, a version of the theorem was first proven by Dunn. And then uh, the really useful version was first proven by Jacob Lurie. And maybe a one categorical version is a well known result by Ekman Hilton. And the theorem states the following so for any, any symmetric monoidal infinity category C, infinity category C, we, have, we can look at the category of En algebras in C. And by what I said earlier, this carries a pointwise tensor product. Like where the tensor product of algebra is just underlying, and I guess I said this earlier under some extra assumptions on C, but neither of those are necessary. And then what you can do is you can actually look at EM algebras 
in this symmetric monoidal category of EN algebras. And the statement of Dunn additivity is that an EM algebra in an EM N algebra is the same as an EN plus M algebra in C. And this is actually, in fact, if you contemplate it, it's true for N, M larger or equal zero, and also infinity is allowed, where infinity plus infinity is infinity. Okay, and that is, that then finishes the proof because I guess then you get that in E1 algebra and E1 algebra is in E2 algebra and being group-like is just a single condition on pi naught. <coughs> and so here this tells you actually, I mean, what does this mean for n equals 1? This means an E2 algebra is the same as an E1 algebra in E1 algebras. So in other words, if you think about what it means to have an E1 algebra and E1 algebra, this means you have two different E1 structures. So in other words, two different multiplications and they they, I mean, each multiplication is a homomorphism for the other, right? And so the one categorical version of C is a one category. This is the classical Ekman-Hilton statement. If you have an associative algebra in associative algebras, then in fact it's, it's, it's commutative and the two multiplications agree. And here somehow this tells me that if I have an, this in, in infinity land, then I get an E2 algebra. And that's actually the way I personally think about EN algebras. An EN structure and EN algebra structure is the same as N commuting E1 structures. N commuting structures of an associative algebra on an object. And that finishes my discussion of the example of EN algebras in spaces. And let me finish this whole lecture by stating the following corollary. And the corollary is that, um, I mean, if I, if I if I'm generally have an E-infinity, E-n algebra in any symmetric monoidal infinity category, and here I assume this has sifted co-limits. C has geometric realizations, realizations, and tensor commutes with them. With them in both variables separately. And in this, that case, I can look at the bar construction. And what do I mean by bar construction? I mean, I, I'm going to say that in a second, but the statement is that the bar construction gives me an EN minus 1 algebra in C. And what do I mean by the bar construction? I just mean you take an EN algebra A, and then you just have and I guess I should have said pointed object, so um, what's the way to say that? Over EN algebras with a map to the tensor unit. So the tensor unit is in fact always an EN algebra. And so what, what I want to do is I want to send this to, I guess I have here the map to one, two maps to one, both are the same, and then I have A tensor A. I guess Achim has talked about the bar construction and so on and so forth, and it's this co-limit. And what I, what I mean by this co-limit is a priori, so what you, what you can do is you can always forget down to E1. And you have an E1 algebra in C, and then you want to take the bar construction of that, which a priori is just an object in C, or a pointed an object with a map from one, so I guess an E0 algebra. And why is this true now that this bar construction has a structure? And this is now easy. And so the way you do that is you just observe that alch ENC is the same as E1 algebras in EN minus 1 algebras, right? And then you just observe that this is true for N equals 1, the statement. The bar construction of an E1 algebra obviously is an E0 algebra, which is just a pointed object in C, object with a map from the tensor unit. And so I can just replace C by EN minus 1 algebras in C. And then the bar construction in this category is just the functor which sends alch E1 to, I guess, 
e n minus 1 algebras in C. And the fact that the underlying that this bar construction is given by this co-limit is just the fact that sifted uh, geometric realizations of e n minus 1 algebras are just computed as geometric realizations in C. And that proves the statement about the bar construction. And that will be very relevant later when we talk about uh, structures on TH. And again, this is going to be true for n equals infinity as well, where infinity minus 1 is infinity, of course. OK, that ends my lecture about en algebras. And uh, we, will, we will use the theory of en algebras basically for n equals 2 and n equals 1 and n equals infinity in our course on topological cyclic homology. But I think it's, it's a very nice picture that we have all these intermediate layers that interpolate. Thanks very much and stay tuned for further videos.